Good morning. Uh, thank yous to Andrew, Jake, to Tad, and the sponsors of the conference. It's delightful to be here. A little chilly, but uh, <laughs> but uh, good to be here. <clears throat> so late, <clears throat> excuse me, late in the occupation history of the site of Chanudaro and Sindh in the lower Indus Valley, which is in what is today Pakistan, at about 1900 BC, a new painted pottery style emerged, which we call the Jukar Late Harappan. And it replaced the earlier black on red Harappan pottery style. The new vibrant polychrome ware appeared to be revolutionary in that it was so very distinct from the preceding painting style. Yet when we take a close look at the context of its appearance and possible use, it no longer seems revolutionary. Rather, it appears to reflect a new socioeconomic situation at the site. I believe this new labor-intensive painted pottery reflects the desire by the inhabitants of this one community to hang on to an elite-like status whose role in the changing into civilization diminished considerably during the late Harappan period. This late Harappan is now seen as culturally continuous. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay, good. The late Harappan period is now seen as culturally continuous from the earlier mature Harappan or integration phase. But in the later phase, there were no cities, no urban superstructure. There were radical social and economic changes throughout the region of Harappan influence, estimated to be about 680,000 square kilometers. The many lifestyle changes that took place during this during the late Harappan in this supersized area occurred at different rates and followed a varied various paths. For example, overcrowding at the site of Harappa in the Punjab, in contrast to abandonment uh, at the site of Mahanjadaro in Sindh. Uh, and this search for the evidence of cultural change at Chanudaro should be understood as what that specific population at this one site did within the larger context of socioeconomic and political changes throughout the region. To begin with, what is the mature Harappan or the integration phase of the Indus tradition? It is a Bronze Age urban-based cultural system with extensive interaction networks that moved raw materials and finished objects along with technological know-how, tools, and possibly artisans throughout the region. This is evident by a widely found assemblage of stylistically similar objects and materials and technologies. For example, inscribed seal amulets with a, yes, still undeci undeciphered script, a standardized system of stone weights, beads in a wide variety of materials, including clay, faience, and a variety of uh, semi-precious stones, objects made from both riverine and marine shell, and the use of specialized technology, such as the ernestite drill seen here, also known as the constricted cylindrical drill, um, which are specially made from a special material just for those very long, long barrel carnelian beads. And of course, the distinctive Harappan black on red painted pottery. This is in addition to the specific characteristics of the built environment, including mud brick platforms, drains, and street systems. It has been suggested that this material distribution represents a veneer, and this was first sort of put into print by Meadow and Knoyer in 99. The typical Harappan complex of material traits, including script on intaglio seals and other durable media, a system of standardized weights, measures and proportions, bleached, also known as etched, uh, carnelian and other characteristic kinds of beads and ornaments of various materials, particular forms of and decorations on pottery, waterworks of varying degrees of sophistication and a measure of architectural uniformity can now be seen as something of a veneer of varying thickness overlying diverse local and regional cultural expressions of agricultural and pastoral life that had developed during the region in previous millennia. This widespread use of a large body of visual symbols, and I mean not just the motifs on the pottery or those that are carved into the seals, but also the materials themselves and the technology used to produce those artifacts. They serve to unify, maintain, and legitimize the Indus or Harappan civilization. Thus, the ownership of raw materials and technological know-how of the production of these artifacts was crucially important 
during the Harappan phase as markers of identity and affiliation. So now to Chanodaro. The site of Chanodaro is about 80, mi 80 miles downriver from Mahenjadaro. It was approximately four to five hectares when it was extensively excavated by E.J. J. H. Mackay for a single season in 1935-36. Today's presentation focuses solely on Mount Two at the site, and Mackay suggested three stages of occupation history. The layer cake <coughs> we have at the bottom. Uh, the HR2, the second Harappan occupation, followed by the HR1, or the final Harappan occupation, and then the late Harappan Jukar. While abundant data supports Mackay's designation of an HR2 level, or a second Harappan level, across this mound, the following HR1, or final Harappan level, was created by Mackay, and in actual fact is clearly mixed with the late Harappan Jukar material. Hence it is here in this deep mixed deposit that material evidence of cultural change can be found. But let's start with the HR2 level. I hope you can see the plan. Uh, uh, this is the lowest level reached by Mackay on this mound. This is a typical Harappan phase built environment. Extensive use of baked brick, large mud brick platforms, streets, drains, bathing platforms. And these features are very unusual to find at such a small site. In terms of artifacts recovered, there is extensive evidence of craft production with carnelian uh, and other stones, the use of specialized technology, faience, shell, and all of this is evident by the large amount of production waste and tools found in this occupation level. The built environment and artifacts, along with the waste from production activities, indicate that this HR2 settlement was a center for the production of artifacts with specialized technologies. Many different raw materials and objects produced from them were uncovered, and materials such as amethyst, lapis, agate, quartz, shell, faience, amazonite, and copper. Here, I just want to use a few objects and materials to illustrate how this site was specialized as a production center for labor-intensive and highly valued objects. I'm just going to focus on the very long, long barrel carnelian beads, the etched carnelian beads, and shell ladles and bangles. The second Harappan settlement is the only known production site for these, the very long, long barrel carnelian beads, which according to Knoyer can be up to 13 centimeters in length. These beads have been found at the cities of the Indus Valley civilization, as well as in the royal tombs of Ur, yes, in Mesopotamia. The carnelian used at Chanodaro is of superior quality, quality to that used in the carnelian bead week, the workshops at Mahenjadaro. There's also evidence at Chanodaro uh, for the manufacture and use of the specialized ernestite drills specifically made for these beads. Now, as for the etched or carnelian beads, during Mackay's single season of excavation at Chanodaro, he found a total of 22 such beads, which is a greater quantity than the number he found during six years of excavation at Mahenjadaro, which is also a much larger and more intensely excavated site. Mackay also found a much larger quantity of Amazonite at Chanodaro than all the years of work at Mahenjadaro. Thus, the population of the HR2 level had good connections in order to obtain these raw materials, which are found only from distant regions outside of the immediate Indus Valley. This site, Chanodaro, in the HR2 is also one of the few sites known to produce shell ladles, seen on the right. Uh, and it is noteworthy that the ladles, as well as the shell bangles manufactured at Chanodaro, were made from a distinct species of shell, Chicorius ramosus. Was at other sites, and perhaps later other sites, were made from a different shell, Turbinella. Thus, the shell ladles made at Chanodaro are unique. These examples, and there are many others, create the use of high quality types of raw materials, specialized technologies at this particular settlement, the HR2. It's Chanodaro's role as a production objects which were critical to the used in maintaining, providing a visible unifying for the Indus Valley civil. These objects served social groups and expressed cognition. This community saw themselves as unique in a Parapan system. The use of baked brick and the natures are not generally seen, as they were mimicking the urban. This interpreted by Knoyer's argument that the semic structure of the Harappan near, that is the use of artifacts the production and material source areas that the, makes up the veneer was foundational to the creation of the Harappan civilization. To paraphrase Knoyer, artisans in the Harappan 
role in establishing and maintaining the power. Hence, I believe to see that the people of settlement at Chanodaro have in central social and economic status as purveyors and creators of highly desired ideological objects. And they probably knew this. The HR2 occupation ends, and it appears that the mound is deserted for an unknown period of time, but not too long because there's no evidence of a debris layer. When it's resettled, however, the new occupation is much smaller, restricted to the western half or the top half here in this image uh, of the mound, while the eastern portion or the lower half is robbed of bricks in order to build structures in the west. And I want to emphasize that uh, this is the published version of the map, which I've compared to various uh, uh, drawn bits I found in the archives. And Mackay had this habit of, of enhancing especially the eastern, that lower section there. He liked, thing, liked things to make them, you know, very square and very wrong. And those remains are actually much more fragmentary. But what you can see in this, in the western section is there's no streets, no platforms, no evidence of communal planning. Just a concentration of baked brick structures that were reoccupied again and again over an extensive period of time, with the brick walls being extended in height over and over. So these are actual photos from Mackay's excavation. We are looking at, uh, this, is the, you see, this is the eastern half, and this is the built-up western half, and you can see the difference in elevation. Here's another view. We are standing in the eastern half, looking at the western built-up again and again and again. And then finally, this is the, the fragments of the east, and this is the built-up area in the west. Mackay's actual plan of this upper level, this, this HR, supposed HR1, is actually includes both the HR1 and the Jukar because he couldn't distinguish between what was HR1 and what was Jukar. And he believed that, and even though he, couldn't, he could not distinguish them, he believed that there had to be two different populations, one the HR1, the other the Jukar. This is based on the very different Jukar ceramics and the disappearance of the Harappan veneer. Mackay was trying to demonstrate a clear break between the two. However, in actual fact, the entire HR1 Jukar deposit represents one continuous occupation and the finds are very mixed, including Harappan and Jukar attributed objects and built remains. In this period of continued reoccupation, with a total deposit of 14 to 16 feet in the West only, there is little evidence for production, and most raw materials disappear. These baked brick structures of walls continuously extended and included blocked up doorways, narrow doorways, multiple superimposed thresholds, new doorways, and existing walls, scattered fireplaces, and odd pavement fragments. In other words, evidence of continuous occupation. No evidence of planning, no platforms, no drains, no streets. And within the extended walls, the finds of small objects and pottery of both Harappan and Jukar styles are mixed. Harappan style small finds and a few painted ceramics are primarily found in the lowest deposits within the strata. And then they sort of peter out, being replaced by the non-Harappan small finds and Jukar painted pottery. This is not a superficial or ephemeral deposit. It shows duration of occupation and use. That is one cultural stratum with evidence of cultural change. What disappears is the veneer, the Harappan veneer, the architecture and planning, the weight system along with the writing system, the corpus of distinct symbols, including materials and technologies. There's no marker, no break, no, uh, sorry, no break indicating a distinct shift from Harappan style to Jukar style. The people who occupied these structures, regardless of whether attributed to Mackay's HR1 or the Jukar, used the same construction method, and there was no change in orientation throughout the duration of occupation. The leftovers of the Harappan veneer found in this HR1 Jukar are not carried forward, nor are they reproduced, and thus the veneer soon disappears. And while faience technology continues, there's no shell, no copper, no signs of production of beads from semi-precious stones, as in the HR2 level, which is directly beneath it. What does change and predominate in these upper deposits is the new style of painted pottery. There's also a hodgepodge of small finds, especially in the odd assortment of round seal amulets, but in my opinion, they, are, they don't make up a convincing cultural assemblage, and I've published this elsewhere. Happy to share the reference with anyone. What changes and is found in abundance is the painted pottery. Jukar painted ceramics are polychrome with variable slip and paint colors. 
Slips are cream, shades of red, or not present. Paint colors range from black to black purple to purple brown to brown. There is the use of wide red bands bordered with thin black brown lines, as seen here. And the motifs used are very geometric and highly standardized. The differences between Oh, sorry, the differences between the Jukar polychrome ceramic and the Harappan black on red painted ceramics appear to be so distinct that Mackay and others believe that a new population had settled at the site. Yet there are similarities between the two styles, and I'm just going to show you a couple of attributes that are shared between the two corp. This is the dish on stand. These are from the uh, late Harappan, but the, the form itself uh, is widely found in the Harappan. Ledge rims. Uh, though this is a completely different vessel form in the late phase, the rim itself is found in the previous Harappan. And these are stump bases or uh, base vessels that are in the Harappan are small and plain, thought to be drinking vessels. And in the Jukar, they're much larger and they're painted. Also, a recent, recently completed petrographic thin section analysis of 10 Jukar style shirts and 10 Harappan painted shirts from Chanudaro was completed by Professor Krishnan at the University of Baroda. And he concluded that the same clay source was used for both the Jukar and the Harappan painted ceramics. Though he was able to define two distinct, uh, not pretty distinct fabric groups, which interestingly enough correspond to the Harappan versus the Jukar, but he sees the same firing conditions, raw material and overall mineralogy. And he believes that the differences between the two fabric groups has to do with the type of kiln used. So and these are just some bullet points. I don't think you can see them in the back. I'll just read them quickly. The Harappan painted pottery has uniform paint and slip colors. Dish on stand form varies, meaning that it changes over time. And a limited number of closed uh, paint, the painted shapes, in contrast to the Jukar pottery, which has a variety of paint and slip colors. Oh, yes, yes gotcha. Dish on stand form is highly standardized, and there's a variety of closed painted shapes. So we're seeing there's some interesting patterning going on between the two corpi. Now, I think of this new polychrome pottery emerges out of a need for a new ideology. Conscious of the important role they played producing the Harappan veneer during the mature phase, in the late Harappan, the population may have been trying to reestablish themselves, proclaiming their specialness via a labor-intensive, expressive, and very visible painted pottery. Keep in mind that this new painted style emerges in the post-urban period when the script and cube weights are no longer used and the veneer, raw materials, and connections all disappear. With the loss of the other symbols of ideology and affiliation and the loss of access to rare ma materials, along with no consumer demand for specialized artifacts, ceramics may have been used to fill the void and thus the overall structure of design was emphasized within the use of a very narrow range of motifs, yet a variety of slip and paint colors. At Chanudaro, this was an active though small community eager to continue a lifestyle they had experienced, a group desiring to retain social status, and they used painted pottery to express this because that's all they had. <laughs>